Most energy is produced in the, in the neurons, and the neurons have up to 5,000 mitochondria, or powerhouses. And the reason for that is because they use more energy than anywhere else in the body. So the brain is only 2% of the weight of the body, but uses 20% 20 of all the ATP produced. So it's a very hungry organ. And we know that this energy bond is called adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. And we see here we've got the adenine part, which is the same as the adenine in making DNA and RNA, uh, along with the ribose, which is the sugar. So this part of it is very similar to, um, uh, AT, uh, to uh, adenosine uh, phosphates as far as the nucleotides and nucleosides. This phosphate part has three phosphates, one, two, three, which is why it's called adenosine triphosphate. <coughs> uh, but you'll notice that the last two here are bonded together by magnesium. So technically this is called magnesium ATP. Now we produce ATP in other areas of the body which is not magnesium ATP. So when we come to test energy in people, we should really use the right biomarker which is magnesium ATP. So magnesium ATP therefore is the marker to see whether the person is tired. So if they strengthen to ATP, they will weaken to ADP, which is when we've given up that uh, last phosphate and lost that phosphate group, and we made adenosine diphosphate. So this is like a discharge or partially discharged battery. So we have a charged battery and a discharged battery. Charged, discharged. Remember this is going on uh, hundreds if not thousands of times a second inside the mitochondria of the cell. We do not store energy. We have to make it. So if a person is tired, they will strengthen to magnesium ATP and therefore weaken to magnesium ADP because that's like a discharge battery. So this is the best way to tell people you've got too many discharge batteries. But of course they're not totally ADP, otherwise they would hardly be able to drag themselves around. It's a percentage. You know, you might be 20% down, 30% down on what is optimal. Now making energy, I always teach people, is as easy as one, two, three. Nothing complex about making energy, providing you use this system. And if you use this system, it's quite easy. So we draw a line down, that's how you learn it. You draw a circle and then you draw a horizontal line across. One, two, three. So number one is called glycolysis. And this occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell, so and requires no oxygen. And the substrate for this is usually glucose. So this is the glucose you get from your carbohydrates in your meal. And the first pathway finishes before we go into the mitochondria. So this round part here is the mitochondria. So this is called glycolysis, and there's no oxygen used there, so it's anaerobic. Okay, so the end product of this is called pyruvic acid. Now pyruvic acid will then cross the mitochondria, go through a cycle of oxidation called the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle, which will produce various um, hydrogens as a byproduct, which go into the mitochondrial membrane called the electron transport. Uh, which is in between the two mitochondrial membranes. So the end product of the glucose here is pyruvate. We cross the mitochondria, which comes into making acetyl-CoA. We then spin the Krebs cycle and give off NADH for the hydrogen, or FADH2. These are the coenzymes of vitamin B2 and B3. They then go into the mitochondrial membranes, as we'll see, and split, because hydrogen is a simple atom of one electron and one proton. So it splits. The protons go one way, the electrons go the other. Okay, so it's a real nuclear reactor. We have a mini nuclear reactor. And this is where most of the ATP is produced. So 95% or more of the ATP produced in the body is in the mitochondria here. So for every one molecule of glucose, we produce 38 molecules of ATP if the system is working properly. And the vast majority of that is in the mitochondria. We can use alternative fuel, fuel sources. And the alternatives can be fatty acids. So when we run out of glucose and glycogen, we should start to burn fat. So we can burn our fats, and this is, goes straight into making acetyl-CoA, straight into the Krebs cycle. 
and we can burn amino acids or proteins, which again pop themselves in in different locations of the Krebs cycle, and are recycled back through the liver to make more glucose, which forms the substrate again. Making new burning proteins is very expensive. It's obviously much cheaper to burn fat than anything else, or carbohydrates through glucose. We don't really want to burn protein, because if you haven't got the proteins or amino acids in your blood, you have to get those amino acids from somewhere, and you will get them from your muscle. The muscle is the biggest source of protein in the body, and it's largely what are called branch-chain amino acids, valine, leucine, and isoleucine, and you will strip those out of your muscle. And when you've lost a muscle, that's it. It's gone, okay? Every muscle fiber you lose, you don't replace. You are born with a finite number of muscle fibers, and every one you lose, that's it. You can atrophy from not using it, but if you actually lose the fiber itself, it's called sarcopenia, you've lost it, okay? And it's very difficult without stem cell therapy to regrow muscle fibers. So you want to hold on to everything you've got. So a lot of people are looking with athletes and older people to prevent sarcopenia is to take branch chain amino acids, especially if they do a lot of exercise. So you don't want to burn your body out and burn your muscles up. It'd be easier to use some branch chain amino acids. So this is where we produce most of our uh, energy. Now to produce energy, we need a certain amount of uh, nutrients. And these are called cofactors and coenzymes. So the main nutrients to, in the first path, glycolysis, is magnesium. What's the other one? Magnesium. And the other one is magnesium. Magnesium, 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 magnesium. Eight cycles, eight pathways, it's all used magnesium. So the most important nutrient in glycolysis is magnesium. Okay. There's a little bit of zinc. One pathway uses zinc and one, one enzyme uses potassium. And NAD, which is the coenzyme of B3. Now, coenzymes are the activated vitamins in the body, which actually give something to the biochemical equation. In this case, they're going to give a hydrogen. So the oxidized form is called NAD, and the reduced form, which has the hydrogen, is called NADH. So NADH can donate a hydrogen to NAD or to any other biochemical pathway. So these are called coenzymes. And most coenzymes are the activated forms of the vitamin Bs. Okay, so those of you who are new to any of the modules may not quite know what a coenzyme is. But most coenzymes, and there's 20 of these, 16 of them are activated vitamin Bs. So the second quiz of the day is what are the other four? Okay. So clue number one, vitamin C, because that takes hydrogen, uh, is an oxidizing re reaction. Alpha lipoic acid, SAM, SAM, super um, acid, and the last one is called coenzyme Q10. Okay. So that's not a vitamin B. So those ones. Now coenzyme Q10, and we're going to meet again because that's very important in the mitochondria. Getting pyruvate across the mitochondrial membrane into the Krebs cycle, we need B1, B2, B3, and we need alpha lipoic acid and magnesium. And the co part comes from B5. So in the transport across the mitochondrial membrane, we need B1, B2, B3, B5, alpha lipoic acid, and more magnesium. And then we've got to spin the Krebs cycle, and each part of the Krebs cycle has different coenzymes to there. And we need B1, B2, B3, B5. These are all the coenzyme forms of them. We need alpha lipoic acid and a number of minerals. And the main, again, the main mineral here is magnesium. And in this case, we need manganese as well. Now, magnesium, manganese, zinc are called cofactors because they activate the enzymes to get them to work. So a coenzyme is something which actually participates in the enzymic reaction whereas a cofactor is something that locks onto the enzyme and activates it. And these are minerals. So when I talk about cofactors, I usually mean a mineral like magnesium or zinc, and a coenzyme will be an active vitamin B. So here we are now in the Krebs cycle, giving off hydrogens from NAD, from B3 and B2. Now this is a, a lovely chart I put together some years ago, the energy pathway. This pathway is called glycolysis. Remember, it uses no oxygen. The oxygen is only used inside the mitochondria here. 
So the citric acid will go on to produce some energy, but the vast majority is in the membrane, from the outer membrane to the inner membrane. And it all occurs here inside of travelling, uh, of pumping protons into the membrane space here, and electrons. So remember I said what we're doing is we're producing hydrogens from NADH and FADH2. All right? So we've got hydrogens. It's like an atomic bomb, or like a hydrogen bomb. As soon as it goes in there, they split. So what we're doing is we're putting protons into the membrane. That means we've got a spare electron. You don't want a spare electron, do you? Because if you've got a spare electron, it's, it creates oxidation wherever it goes, and it will create oxidative damage. So we have to carry the electron. And we carry the electron, the first two which come in on complex one, via a compound called coenzyme Q10 to complex two. Where the hydrogen, two more hydrogens come in there from FADH2, and we carry that with the CoQ10 to complex three. Okay? That's where coenzyme Q10 comes in, and that's called ubiquinone. Okay? So that's, that's the, uh, the active form in the mitochondria of CoQ10. So every time uh, hydrogen comes in here and here, we get an equal number of electrons and we get an equal number of protons. And eventually, the concentration of the proteins here, protons, builds up that they burst out at this point at the, at the other end here and simply activate an enzyme called ATPase, which converts ADP to ATP. Okay? So it's all about the build-up of protons. But we've still got the electrons to get rid of. Okay? And this is the dodgy thing. The electrons are the dodgy thing because they cause a lot of damage. So we have another transport molecule that takes us from complex 3 to complex 4. And this is called cytochrome C. Cytochrome C. So this is rather like CoQ10, but it's a totally different structure. So it carries now four electrons from complex three to complex four. Okay, so now we're carrying four electrons. The complex uh, cytochrome C is a heme enzyme. So it contains heme. And that heme is exactly the same as in hemoglobin. Okay. Now there are various properties about hemoglobin and heme insofar that they can absorb photons of light and they can also emit photons of light. Okay? So they're like a battery charging and discharging, charging, discharging. And I talked this morning a little bit about where the light possibly comes from, from biophotons as they're called, okay, emanating from the mitochondria. So it'll be from the light sensitive tissue. And cytochrome C is a light sensitive tissue. Now, when cytochrome C gives out a blue light at a radiation of 450 nanometers, you know what it's producing? Carbon monoxide, okay? So you can imagine breathing carbon monoxide is probably not very good, okay? It's like a, a gas which is going to asphyxia in there. So your mem system here will switch from being aerobic to being anaerobic because you won't produce your ATP here, so you'll produce it here instead. And this only produces a very small amount. So that would be push us into more a protective, if you like, anaerobic shutdown, uh, anaerobic pathway, shut down the aerobic, which is what we do from time to time when we don't want so much energy or free radicals, such as in tissue repair and cell division. So if in the presence of a lack of oxygen, which we'll see in a minute, we will go on to break that carbon monoxide down into cyanide. And cyanide is a much more potent substance than carbon monoxide. Okay? That will kill off your cytochrome C much quicker than anything else. Take a dose of cyanide, it's a matter of minutes and you've gone from this world. Okay? So this is where we want to look at this production of energy. And because this is where it starts to get exciting and you're the first people really to be able to know how to look at this and be able to tell a person who's got an energy problem exactly where their energy problem is and why they've got this and what they need, of course, to be able to get out of it. So let's jump on from there. So we've got glycolysis. Let's have a quick look here. This is where our pyruvate crosses the mitochondrial membranes. This is the outer membrane, this is the inner one. And this, everything above here is anaerobic and everything from there onwards requires oxygen in the mitochondria. This is where we use the oxygen. So this is called the citric acid. This is called electron transport oxidative phosphorylation. So if we have a look closer look now at there, we see we've got pyruvate. Okay, pyruvate will cross 
to acetyl-CoA, which is the substrate or the beginning substance for the Krebs cycle. And the enzyme that does this is pyruvate dehydrogenase. And this enzyme is vitamin B1 dependent. Okay, so far? Now we know that various enzymes are stimulated by certain cofactors. Uh, so in this case, the coenzyme would be B1, but the cofactors would be things like magnesium, etc., or zinc even here. But we also know that things can inhibit enzymes from working. We've talked about cyanide, for instance. So if you have a buildup of cyanide in the body, what substance would you think would absorb cyanide? Question, you know the answer to this. <laughs> no, well, turmeric does absorb all sorts of things. It's actually B12, hydroxycobalamin. Okay? Hydroxycobalamin has a strong affinity for cyanide and turns into what's called cyanocobalamin. And this is why sometimes you find people just drink vitamin B12. They never get any further. You know, they, they need um, hundreds of drops of B12. And the next time you test them, they still need loads of B12. And you think, what do they do with this B12? Are they absorbing it or not absorbing it? Where's it going? And what they're doing is they're converting hydroxycobalamin into cyanocobalamin and peeing it out. It's the way the body gets rid of cyanide. Take them off apple pips. <laughs> That's a good source of cyanide. But the real source of cyanide is actually in the mitochondria because they're actually going hypoxic. They're very, very low. So if a person shows high in B12 all the time, it's not unusual for them to have the blockage here to here. So these people will strengthen from a functional biochemistry point, will function to acetyl-CoA, they're strengthened, but they'll weaken to pyruvate, right? Because they've got a relative buildup. So it's like a dam. You've got a river flowing down, you put a dam across, Above the dam, the river gets higher, the water gets higher. Below, it goes down to a trickle, all right? So this is what happens here. So if we have a blockage in this enzyme, for some reason, because of a toxin, we'll get a buildup of pyruvate and a deficiency, relatively, of acetyl-CoA. Well, obviously, we won't cut the thing off completely because we'll be dead pretty quickly, okay? It's a relative. It may go down 20%, 30%, even more, possibly. Now, anything that can inhibit here will give us a buildup of pyruvate. And that could be toxic metals. Mercury, for instance, has a very um, strong effect here. So if on this point of view we've got mercury in here, and that mercury inhibits this enzyme from working, we won't produce the energy properly. And if you don't produce energy in your neuron, what happens to your neuron? It's going to die, you know, because it's going to starve, because it's going to absorb calcium and sodium, and it's a our pumps aren't sufficient to pump it out anymore, and we turn to stone. Okay? So it becomes more obvious, you think, ah, the key is energy. What I do sometimes is I scale uh, with a verbal challenge on people's health, and health being all-encompassing. With 100, we put as an arbitrary figure, is the best the person has ever been in their life, or could be, with full genetic expression. And out of 100, where are they now? And they may come in at 80%. And if you change the words of that and say vitality instead of health um, or energy, they all come out with the same figure. It's still 80%, whatever it is. So in other words, energy equates to with vitality, equates with health, equates with life. It's, it's all the same thing. It's all energy. If you haven't got the energy, you haven't got your life back, have you? You've got to get your life back by getting your energy pathway up. So if we're working primarily or more anaerobically, we're tired, that's for sure. So our problem could be from anywhere from here onwards. So if we strengthen to pyruvate, it means we've got a problem further back in glycolysis. There's only one thing you've really got to think about there is magnesium, 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 and magnesium. Okay? If, on the other hand, it's from there onwards, you don't strengthen the pyruvate, but they do strengthen to acetyl-CoA, we know the problem's in here. So we largely be looking at B1, possibly B2, B3 to recycle alpha lipoic acid. Okay, that's so alpha lipoic acid will help cofactor this, uh, or coenzyme it rather, to make the acetyl CoA. So CoA is the active form of vitamin B5, the active coenzyme of vitamin B5, 
and the acetyl part is the conversion of pyruvate. So what we're left with is acetyl-CoA as the substrate for the Krebs cycle. Now we looked upon acetyl-CoA this morning. Short-term memory, long-term memory, okay? Where did we see acetyl-CoA? It's the substance that makes acetyl-choline, okay? Which runs our neuromuscular junctions and our brain memory, all right? So this is why if you don't make acetyl-CoA here, properly, because you've got a blockage here, you can't think straight, you can't recall in your memory. So this brings us thinking, hmm, these vitamin Bs are rather important, don't they? So if you wanted to activate your memory, you want to make sure you've got enough acetylcholine, and you're not really into kinesiology or what to do, give the patient, or particularly the student, if you like doing an exam, B-complex with the active nutrients in the B. So if you give the B-complex, you've got B1, B2, B3, B5, B6, etc. folic acid, B12, choline, inositol, all the things that you need, okay? and magnesium. So as long as they've got those factors, then at least they will be able to make acetyl-CoA, which the acetyl part can go on then to make acetylcholine. Now one of the observations we made here is that we also detoxify um, with acetyl as phase two liver detoxification. We can um, conjugate um, having hydroxylated with cytochrome P450, phase one, and then phase two is to conjugate with uh, glutathione, glucuronic acid, sulfur and so on, and acetylation. And one of the things that we found as far as the chemical is concerned, which always goes through the acetylation pathway, is petroleum. So anything of petroleum nature where people have reactions to petroleum, petroleum byproducts, and particularly one of those was the print in uh, newspapers and magazines. And it took me a while before I discovered this, uh, because I uh, used to open the newspaper and then the eyes would start to sting quite quickly afterwards. I thought, oh, what is this? And, uh, and uh, Sam, you said that uh, the worst ones were colour supplements. Cheap paper, cheap ink on there, and they were awful. Most of the colour supplements, the vapour coming off there was petrochemical. And I thought this is interesting because uh, my meridian, which I'll tell you about later on, is the gallbladder, and that is associated with low levels of acetylcholine. And acetylation and me, that's my defect, if you like. So I don't produce enough acetyl groups to make acetylcholine the potentiality and to acetyl chemicals which have to go through acetylation pathways. So that's why I'm sensitive to petroleum products. Some people are so bad they can't go in a petrol station. You know, they have to get somebody else to fill the car up because they just can't stand there with the, with the pump. It can be that bad. And the same with a lot of perfumes, isn't it? Same thing. They, they, they're, they're fragrance sensitive, and these are people with acetylation problems. Okay, so that's acetyl-CoA is quite important. We then, then, that's B5, you see, pantothenic acid is the raw vitamin, and it goes on through a series of processes to make coenzyme A, which is then acetylated to make acetyl-CoA. But I put this one on because you'll see the first pathway here requires ATP, adenosine triphosphate. The second pathway needs ATP, the third pathway needs pyridoxal 5-phosphate, or B6. The third, fourth one is ATP, and the fifth one is ATP. That means if your energy is low, you can't even activate your vitamins to make them into coenzymes to make you make energy. So you get caught, don't you? You're really absolutely caught. And the majority of our patients are caught. They can't make energy, so they ram in more and more vitamins and, and magnesiums and things, anything they can to do a holding job. And they tell me that within a day or so, of stopping them, they go, whoo, down, okay? So the nutrients that they're taking are merely doing a holding job. Thank heaven they are, because they feel better. But if you took those off hypothetically, because people shake at the very thought of not being allowed to take them, uh, they drop right down, because that's not the cause of the problem. That's the answer, if you like. We've got to get to where the, f where the fire is, and not where the smoke is. Okay, so we know that energy is involved even with making the very coenzymes to get us going to making energy in the first place. So we, uh, Bruce Ames came up with a formula. Um, Bruce Ames is one of the leading biochemists in the world and, in, and invented the Ames test for testing toxins out. Um, some years ago now, probably 10, 15 years ago, of mixing alpha lipoic acid, which helps us to get the uh, glucose, the pyruvate across the, the membrane, 
and also to burn fats, oxidative phosphorylation, from burning stored fats across the membrane to making acetyl-CoA. And to do this, you need alpha-lipoic acid and you need a substance called uh, carnitine. Now, carnitine is a mixture of methionine and lysine, as far as the actual amino acid structure. But acetyl-carnitine, which is a synthetic substance, will get it across much better and also donate the acetyl group. So acetyl-carnitine with alpha-lipoic acid was found to, in his words, to make old rats young because they were able to do beta oxidation much more effectively, in other words, to burn fat. So they were able to use their stored fat for their source of energy rather than just the glucose system, which was getting rather clogged up. And this has to be on a four to one ratio. So it's got 400 milligrams of acetylcarnitine to 100 milligrams of alpha lipoic acid. And the usual dose of this is one to two capsules per day. So I used to call this spicing up your granny mix. <laughs> some years ago, and then I thought, hmm, that's quite an interesting compound. And of course, as you get a bit older, you think, I might have a go at that myself. <laughs> so if you're feeling that your energy pathway isn't so good, and you can't get over that hurdle of burning fat and getting that extra amount of energy, then you might consider this. Because if you don't make the energy, you then don't pump out your neurons, and that's how the aging process goes as far as the neurological side is concerned. <coughs> so let's cut right down into the mitochondria now. This is the inner membrane, this is the outer membrane. I described the series of complexes, one, two, three, four. Uh, complex one receives the hydrogens from NADH, which is created in various pathways in the Krebs cycle. Okay, so we produce four molecules of NAD, NADH. And we produce one molecule of FADH2, which is the active form of vitamin B2. So that means we're taking in two protons and two hydrogens. Right? Remember, hydrogen is the simplest atom there is. Split hydrogen up, you've got one proton and one electron. Okay? This is the hydrogen bomb. Okay? So you put the two electrons in here and two protons. So now you're filling up the membranes with protons. Okay? Now that those two electrons are carried on coenzyme Q10, where they receive another two electrons and another two protons go in here. So now we've got four protons and four electrons. Okay, this is a hot potato. You wouldn't want to carry an electron. So what this does is it, it basically it oxidizes, reduce CoQ10, and oxidizes it. So we have to recycle CoQ10 uh, to remake it. So we now get to complex three. Complex three will then carry the electrons by cytochrome C to complex four. And it's at complex four that oxygen comes in of most of the oxygen that we breathe, 80% is used here, to convert the electrons, to take the four electrons through the oxidative phosphorylation to make water and molecular oxygen. Very clever. So the rest of the protons, which is what actually drives the ATPase to make ATP, builds up and up and up and up, and then comes out through this channel here, and that stimulates the enzyme called ATPase, which pops the phosphoryl group onto ADP to make ATP. And that's what the whole thing's about. Which is crazy, really. It's so complex to actually make a bit of energy. Uh, and that this it was developed you know, so many billion years ago in the aerobic cell. Now, let's have a look at complex four. That's why I've ringed that round. What we're doing in complex four is we're adding the four electrons which we've delivered to here. Four electrons are coming in from cytochrome C. If we add one electron to oxygen, we put a spare electron on it, and that's called superoxide. Okay? That's a free radical because it's got an extra electron on the outer orbit, which is loose. It's a free body. It can attack anything and oxidize it, particularly fatty acids that Jill was talking about. They go rancid and because they have these... Uh, and when an oil goes rancid, it goes, changes its constituency, so it's lost its fluidity. So it can't act as a normal cell membrane anymore. So if you get rancid fats in your membranes, in your neurons, they won't work properly. They don't transmit the charge, etc. Remember the substance you test a person if they've gone rancid? Malondialdehyde. Okay, that's the substance you use. So if you've got a patient who weakens that, they are going rancid. They don't like being told that. Mm -hmm. right? But the answer was the vitamin E, if you remember, to stop the rancidity, which is the job of why 
E is naturally within vegetable oils and plant oils. It's the major source of it. When we add two electrons to molecular oxygen, we make hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. Okay? This is a highly oxidizing substance. Pour it on your skin and you'll go white in no time at all. You'll get like a vitiligo there. Okay? But it is not a free radical. Okay? It's not a free radical. It's a highly oxidizing, but it's not got a loose electron, one or more. Add three electrons and we get the dreaded hydroxyl radical, which is a free radical, because again we've got a free electron here. And add the fourth electron and we get water and molecular oxygen. So this is a really clean machine, providing we whip four electrons on in one go. But if we whip them on unilaterally, in other words, one at a time, univalently, not sorry, not unilaterally, univalently, we can get a series of free radicals or reactive oxygen species produced which is good when we need it, but bad when we don't need it. And we need it to kill microbes. If we didn't have free radical production or reactive oxygen, we would never get rid of free of uh, infections in our body. Okay? We'd never lead to tissue repair, um, and we would die pretty quickly. So let's have a look here. Reactive oxygen species, because we hear a lot about reactive oxygen species or free radicals, because they oxidize the oils and then the tissues die. So we have normal mitochondrial oxidation. That's what we've looked at. Normal oxidation will occur, and it, yes, it's on the chart, thank you. you. You've all got the chart in front of you. Okay, so there will be something like 5% leakage in the mitochondrial membranes of free radicals. So we get about 5%. Some say it's two, some say it's higher than that. But in normal oxidative reactions, anywhere where there's oxidation in the body, you will get a percentage will be free radicals of superoxide being produced. Respiratory burst, that means when we liven up our particularly our white cells, we want to rev them up so they produce more free radicals to kill the bugs. That's one of the major ways that we kill infections, is to oxidize them. We spray reactive oxygen species onto the bug to kill it. Okay? You do it every day with your Clorox or your uh, chlorine compounds. I've got to be careful not to mention any names. <laughs> Bleach, that's the word. Yeah. Okay. So we have a respiratory burst, which we produce an abundant supply of reactive oxygen. Phase one detoxification. Every time we detoxify a xenobiotic or a toxic substance, so every time you take a chemical, which is not a natural chemical in your body, you go through phase one detoxification, which produces one molecule superoxide. Okay, you think about that. Every time you take a drug, which is not a natural substance, because that's why it's a drug, you will produce reactive oxygen species. Okay. Every time you take in toxins into the body, you will create free radicals or reactive oxygen species. Okay. And they will damage your tissues. And this is why people in heavy industrialized areas all look 10, 20 years older than what they are and suffer a range of different disorders. So here. And the last one is hypoxia. So hypoxia actually produces more reactive oxygen species because it shuts this area down and produces carbon monoxide and cyanide and kills off cytochrome C. So if you kill off cytochrome C, you're left with four electrons in there with nobody to take them. So an electron is like, some of you have baked potatoes at lunchtime, is like me handing Jane a hot potato. What do you do with it? You hand it to somebody else, don't you? Okay. And Jill told us this morning, if you happen to be a cell membrane and I hand you this hot potato, okay, you will become oxidized or you get rid of it. And the thing that will protect you is vitamin E. But vitamin E itself will then become oxidized and that has to be protected and hand the electron to somebody else, which is vitamin C. Okay? And vitamin C says, I'm now oxidized. How do I get reduced again? Your job is lipoic acid. Okay? And that's why Jill said, if you put alpha lipoic acid into vitamin C and the vitamin E, then you protect yourself against lipid peroxidation. Okay? So the major protectors against li lipid peroxidation is vitamin E in the body. So whenever you've got neurological problems, in other cell membranes that are going rancid, you must get the E, check them for the E. Right? And that E, as we learn, is not just alpha tocopherol, which is what all the books measure vitamin E by. So when you buy yourself a pot of vitamin E capsules, it'll say that contains 200 international units of alpha tocopherol. Okay? Alpha tocopherol is all they measure as the standard. 
we now know there's four types of tocopherols, and there's four types of tocotrienols, which are like cousins to the tocotrienols, and they all have their own individual effects, okay? And all very important. Some are much richer in tocotrienols, and some are much richer in uh, uh, tocopherols. I think rice bran oil and wheat germ oil were the only two oils that we discovered had all four tocopherols and all four tocotrienols. So they're quite rare. Then we found that pistachio was very rich in the gamma tocopherol um, and tocotriol. And that the amazing thing about sesamol in sesame seed is it inhibited the breakdown of vitamin E. So it actually get the vitamin E levels rose in the body by taking sesame seeds. Yeah. So that's why that was forms a very nice vitamin E. So those four things, normal respiratory oxidation, respiratory burst when we got an infection, detoxification, cytochrome P450, and hypoxia, and hyperoxia. Now, you're not likely to have hyperoxia. Very few people have got over-oxygen in their system unless they've been in a diving bell. So if you go in a diving bell for any reason, you definitely need to take antioxidants to protect you against the increased free radicals which will be produced. All right? But that's for people who've got MS and things who go into diving bells. But for the normal, most of us, our problem is not that. When we got interested last year in hypoxia, we found that it's the most common deficiency in the body. Okay, much more common than even magnesium or anything else is lack of oxygen. Uh, most people are lacking oxygen. Not by 30%, because they wouldn't be here, but by 2 or 3%. When you put the oximeter on, they would show it to 99, 98, 97, many of them would be 94. We haven't met yet anybody who's 100%. Just think about that. Nobody we've met registers as 100% oxygen, okay? which is what we should all be, really, isn't it? Okay? So hypoxia is one of the most common deficiencies there is. So you'll find this will come up time and time and time and time again. And, of course, lack of ATP. So between those two, they're the big two which cause most of the problems in illnesses, and particularly when the areas of the body where we use more ATP than anywhere else, which is the neurons. So here we see we produce superoxide from those, which goes on to produce hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyl radical, or reduced to molecular oxygen and water. Now, why do we do these? Now, why have we been created, or these have evolved in the body, and they're there for a reason? Now, before we get to the reason, the ones that are underlined here are of a special interest to us, because normal mitochondrial oxidation, phase one detoxification, myeloperoxidase, NADH peroxidase, other peroxidases, catalase, and inducible nitric oxide synthase are all heme-dependent enzymes. They're all made from a substance called heme, which is important in the process of making heme a globin. But this is the light-sensitive substance. You remember I talked about cytochrome P450s, etc., cytochrome Cs? They're all heme molecules, which means they're all sensitive to light. Uh, they can absorb light, which is fantastic, and they can emit light. <laughs> so if they're even in a charged state, they will emit it, and if they're in a low state, they can absorb. You can actually get energy through this from the sunlight. This is why people feel better when they go out in the sun. Most of you went out at lunchtime, you instinctively knew. You know, it's not high vitamin D weather yet. We noticed yesterday the dog went out. It was a sunny day, the dog went out and laid on its side in the sun. You know, and it wasn't warm, it was quite cool. But, you know, he was as happy as can be. You know. He knew the light was good. And we know that light, you get energy, because energy ultimately comes from only one place. It comes from the sun. We convert solar light. In other words, the body that makes, makes us run, our ATP, ultimately comes from the food that we eat, which comes from the trees and the plants, which comes from the sun, 97 million miles away. So we actually get our energy from 97 million miles away. Interesting, but... Okay, so we've made... That. So this is, these enzymes are all heme dependent. So they're all made in the same way. So if there's a defect in making heme for hemoglobin, you would be down on all these enzymes as well, because they're all made in the same, made in the same way. Okay? Right, so why did we make these hyperchlorides bleaches up this pathway? It's to kill bacteria. You've seen the advert, it kills 90% of all known germs. Well, it doesn't. It kills 90% of all known gram positive germs in the bacteria. But there will be some viruses which will be killed by hyperchloride. Hyperchloride is another name for bleach. Okay. okay. Now, 
Let's have a look. Hydrogen peroxide. Why would we produce hydrogen peroxide in the body? It's to kill parasites. The main route is through the eosinophils, which are the specialized white cells that kill parasites. And they need to be protected from the very killing chemical which kills the that they secrete to kill the parasites. Now, nematodes uh, and cestodes are smart. These are parasites which we'll be talking about to we coming tomorrow. Because what they do is they secrete catalase, which antidotes the hydrogen peroxide designed to kill them. That's why the devils are difficult to get rid of, okay? Because they, they produce the very chemicals like the anti-nuclear missiles against the missile which is being sent to, set to, to get rid of them. So they're very difficult to get rid of unless you use outside intervention. Okay? Uh, on this side, we've got nitric oxide, which combining with superoxide produces peroxynitrite here. And this is to kill the gram-negative bacteria and viruses and fungi and some parasites. So these are reactive nitrogen species, inducible nitric oxide here, which can mix with superoxide non-enzymatically. Uh, and we do this to produce um, reactive oxygen species which will kill gram-negative bacteria. So gram-negatives are more here, and gram-positives are more there. <coughs> so that's our reactive oxygen species and why we produce them. If we didn't produce reactive oxygen species, we'd be dead within minutes from the first infection that came around. So we don't want to curse these. On the other hand, we don't want them when we don't want them, <laughs> all right? Because they can do a lot of damage and age our, our tissues. So we need to protect and get them metabolized out. And we do this primarily through the enzymes in the body. And those enzymes are here, are superoxide dismutase, which is mainly a zinc copper dependent enzyme, which reduces superoxide to hydrogen peroxide. And then we reduce hydrogen peroxide here to water by catalase, which is the favored enzyme glutathione peroxidase and other peroxidizing enzymes. So the enzymes are the major way that we get rid of free radicals. If we don't use the enzymes, we back it up with antioxidants. And on that chart, those charts, you've got all the antioxidant foods and compounds for each species of the free radicals that I talked about. So they're very useful if you think, oh, yeah, I've got someone who's got a lot of information, which free radical are they doing, and what sort of foods would be good, what foods contain the enzymes, etc. Okay, so calorie restriction, turmeric, and the ketogenic diet. The ketogenic diet means you eat fats and proteins and not carbs. That means you're pumping your um, energy into the Krebs cycle direct, so you're cutting out the glycolysis. What they know is the glycolytic pathway is stimulated in certain problems, particularly cancer cells, work primarily anaerobically, and so the ketogenic diet has got very popular now of not feeding it into the anaerobic pathway because all cancer cells are anaerobic. So this has gained a lot of ground and a lot of um, uh, interest in aging is maybe we should eat less carbs, which is the opposite, of course, of what they've been saying for the last 30 years, that you should eat more complex carbs and less animal protein. Now people are saying, well, maybe more animal protein is a good idea and less carbs and more fat until you find out, well, what type of fat? And of course, it's the right types of oils that Jill was talking about this morning. So calorie restriction, turmeric, and ketogenic diet create less reactive oxygen species. Okay? So turmeric here is one of the most powerful antioxidants. And we'll see why, because it protects cytochrome C. Remember where cytochrome C is? In the mitochondria, OK? Now, what was the gas produced? If cytochrome C doesn't work properly, it shuts down its carbon monoxide. And what color does it emit? Blue. blue, yes. Now, how would you absorb the nasty color of blue? Is you absorb it with the complementary color and pigments. And what is the opposite to blue? Is yellow and orange, yeah. And what color is turmeric? Orange, yes. Just the color that you're wearing there almost. Well, not quite. Okay. So turmeric has many powerful effects against cytochrome, the buildup of carbon monoxide in cytochrome C. So it protects that molecule structure of, of complex three to complex four. Wonderful. It's worth it. comes up more than anything else as an antioxidant and a protector uh, and a preventer of the aging process. And that's the major reason why it works. It protects the complex, the cytochrome C from complex three to four. Anything that upregulates inflammation, you know, as free radical production, will lead to brain degeneration because that's the topic for the day. 
Uh, that was the chart. I think you did this, Jordan, here, this one. Um, so here we see the puffer, or the f um, polyunsaturated fatty acid becoming oxidized from a free radical. The first line of defense is tocopherol. Okay, and in turn, the tocopherol takes the free radical. It becomes a free radical. And it has to, you hand the free radical then onto vitamin C, which spins around, and that is recycled by alpha-lipoic acid and glutathione peroxidase.